अहम बंद तीसरा न सहा पंच शीला निया चमी द्वितीयम भी अहम बंद तीसरा न सहा पंच शीला निया चमी तथियम भी अहम बंद तीसरा न सहा पंच शीला निया चमी नमो तस्सा भगवतो अरहतो सम्मा संबुद्धस 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 नमो तस्स भगवतो अरहतो सम्मा संबुद्धस बुद्धं शरणं गच्छामि बुद्धं शरणं गच्छामि धम्मं शरणं गच्छामि धम्मं शरणं गच्छामि संघं शरणं गच्छामि संघं शरणं गच्छामि दुतियम पी बुधं सरनं गच्छामि दुतियम पी बुधं सरनं गच्छामि दुतियम पी धमं सरनं गच्छामि दुतियम पी धमं सरनं गच्छामि दुतियम पी संघं सरनं गच्छामि दुतियम पी संघं सरनं गच्छामि तत्यम पि बुद्धं शरणं गच्छामि तत्यम पि बुद्धं शरणं गच्छामि तत्यम पि धम्मं शरणं गच्छामि तत्यम पि धम्मं शरणं गच्छामि तत्यम पि संघं शरणं गच्छामि तत्यम पि संघं शरणं गच्छामि ते शरणगमनं निथितं आमा बंधे पानाति पाता वैरमनी सिखा पदं समादियामि पानाति पाता वैरमनी सिखा पदं समादियामि अदिनादाना वैरमनी सिखा पदं समादियामि अदिनादाना वैरमनी सिखा पदं समादियामि कामे सुमिच्छा चारा वैरमनि सिखा पदं समादियामि कामे सुमिच्छा चारा वैरमनि सिखा पदं समादियामि मुसावादा वैरमनि सिखा पदं समादियामि मुसावादा वैरमनि सिखा पदं समादियामि सुरा मेरा या मज्जा पमादा ठाना वीरमनी सिखा पदं समादियामि सुरा मेरा या मज्जा पमादा ठाना वीरमनी सिखा पदं समादियामि ईमानी पंचा सिखा पदानी सीले न सुगतिंग अंति सीले न भोग संपदा सीले न निबुटिंग अंति तस्मा सीलं विसोधा ये साधु 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 वन हंड्रेड एंड थर्टी एंड इन कनेक्शन विद द फुलफिलिंग ऑफ दिस वर्चुअल डेपेंडेंट ऑन रेक्विजिट्स देर शुड बी टोल्ड द स्टोरी ऑफ द नॉविस संगा Rakita, the nephew, for he may made use of requisites after reviewing or according as it is said. Seeing me eat a dish of rice, quite cold, my perceptor observed, novice, if you are not restrained, be careful not to burn your tongue. On hearing my perceptor's words. I then and there felt urged to act, and sitting in a single session, I reached the goal of arahantship. Since I am now waxed full in thought, like the full moon on the fifteenth, 
and all my cankers are destroyed, there is no more becoming now. And so should any other man aspiring to end suffering make use of all the requisites wisely after reviewing them. So virtue is of four kinds, as virtue of Patimoka restraints, and so on. Bante, what is referring to as a, the novice Sankaraktika, the nephew? So what is the nephew in this case? Whose nephew? No idea. Must be in his name. For the single text says, Bhagineya Sankarakita Samanera. Just his name. Okay, thank you. The commentary might tell you, might say something, but... Uh, according to uh, Mingun Sayadaw, uh, he says, um, a nephew of Tara Maha Siva, and I think says somewhere in here that that's from the uh, Visuddhimaga sub-commentary. And about the verse he's reciting, or the, the verse he's uh, uttering, I guess, so he he was eating the rice cold, and still his preceptor said, "Be careful not to burn your tongue." Is it um, is that mean? Does that mean that be careful not to eat it uh, with greed? I think so. Yeah. Right, thirty one. The first pentad in the fivefold section. The meaning should be understood in accordance with the virtue of those not fully admitted to the order, and so on. For this is said in the Patisambhida. A. What is virtue consisting in limited purification? That of the training precepts for those not fully admitted to the order. Such is virtue consisting in limited purification. What is virtue consisting in unlimited purification? That of the training precepts for those fully admitted to the order, such is virtue consisting in unlimited purification. What is virtue consisting in fulfilled purification? That of magnanimous order, ordinary men devoted to profitable things who are perfecting the course that ends in trainership, regardless of the physical body and life, having given up attachment to life, such is virtue of fulfilled purification. D. What is virtue consisting in purification not adhered to? That of the seven kinds of trainer. Such is virtue consisting in purification not adhered to. E. What is virtue consisting in tranquilized purification? That of the perfect one's disciples with cankers destroyed of the Pacheka Buddhas, of the perfect ones, accomplished and fully enlightened. Such is virtue consisting in tranquilized purification. Sorry, so what did the, going back to this question about the nephew, um, I, I may be just repeating what was already said, but the point is there were two monks with the name Sangharakita, and uh, so one was called the uncle, and one was called the nephew. So these two monks had the same name, for some reason, they all, they both got the same name, and one was the uncle and the other was the nephew. They were related, uncle and nephew, but somehow had the same name. Thank you, Bante. A. Herein, the virtue of those not fully admitted to the order should be understood as virtue consisting in limited purification, because it is limited by the number of training precepts, that is, five or eight or ten. B. That of those fully admitted to the order is describable thus. Nine thousand millions and a hundred, and eighty millions then as well, and fifty plus a hundred thousand, and thirty-six again to swell. The total restraint disciplines, these rules for the enlightened one explains, told under heeds for filling out, which the discipline restraint contains. So although limited in number, it should yet be understood as virtue consisting in unlimited purification, since it is undertaken without reserve and has no obvious limit such as gain, fame, relatives, limbs, or life. Like the virtue of the elder Mahatisa, 
the mango eater who lived at Hiragumba. Dante, who are not admitted fully to the order, the lay people. And novices as well. Dante is free for that venerable one who never abandoned the following good man's <clears throat> recollection. Wealth for a sound limb's sake should be renounced, and one who guards his life gives up his limbs. And wealth and limbs and life, each one of these, a man gives up who practices the Dhamma. And he never tr transgressed a training precept, even when his life was in the balance. And in this way, he reached our hardship with that same virtue of unlimited purification as his support while he was being carried on a lay devotee's back. According to, as it is said, nor your mother, nor your father, nor your relatives and kin have done as much as this for you because you are possessed of virtue. So, stirred with urgency and wisely comprehending with insight, while carried on his helper's back, he reached the goal of our hardship. Dhanang chaji angavara sahitu angang chaji jivitang rakamanu angang dhanang jivitan cha pisabang Chajenaro Dhamman Dhammam Dhammam Anusaranto Deet Give up all those things for the Dhamma Chajenaro Dhammam Anusaranto It's not exactly one who practices the Dhamma That's not uh, Dhammam Anusaranto means one who remembers the Dhamma And uh, while carried on his helper's back does that mean that uh, he lost his limbs, basically, or not? I think we had this story already, right? We did not. I don't remember. But I think I heard you say the story. No, I think this was earlier. 122 and note 32. Oh, okay. Okay, note 32. The elder Mahatisa, it seems, was going on a journey during a famine and being tired in body and weak through lack of food and travel weariness, he lay down at the root of a mango tree covered with fruit. There were many fallen mangoes here and there. Through ownerless mangoes that were lying fallen on the ground near him, he would not eat them in the absence of someone to accept them from. And a lay devotee, who was older than he, went to the elder and learning of his exhaustion, gave him mango juice to drink. Then he mounted him on his back and, and took him to his home. Meanwhile, the elder admonished himself as follows, nor your mother, nor your father, etc. And beginning the comprehension of formations and augmenting insight, he realised arahantship after the other paths in due succession while he was still mounted on his back. C. The magnanimous ordinary man's virtue which from the time of admission to the order is devoid even of the stain of a wrong thought because of its extreme purity, like a gem of purest water, like well-refined gold, becomes a proximate cause for our hunship itself, which is why it's called consisting in fulfilled purification, like that of the Ida's Sangharakita, the great and Sangharakita, the nephew. Why are eight or ten precepts called limited purification? Isn't it technically possible to become an arahant following those precepts? Yeah, it, it, just because you can attain arahantship doesn't mean it's not limited. And it says because it's limited by the number of training precepts. And then the second one is, well, technically it is limited a number, but it's undertaken without reserve and has no obvious limits, such as gain, fame, motives, limbs, or life. In other words, full monastic virtue is seen as unreserved. There's no limits to it, limits placed on it. And uh, why is it says in, in this paragraph that magnanimous, ordinary man's virtue? So they are ordained already, so why are they just ordinary men? Is it because they are not enlightened at all? I don't quite get what you're questions. So why are they ordinary men? Well, becoming a monk doesn't make you unordinary or extraordinary. 
probably says something like putujana. Mm -hmm. Kalyana putujana. Putujana kalyana kanang. And what is magnanimous in this? I mean, I thought that. Uh, kalyana. No, it's a good like... thing. It's a good word. Magnanimous is probably not the right word, but uh, it's an interesting word. You can look it up. Grandiose, no? No. Noble, basically. I mean, magnanimous is someone who is uh, good, really. We often use it, I think, to talk about people who are kind. Yeah, people who are kind or forgiving, sort of thing. Okay. Generous. So it's a good it's a good way of translating Kalyana, but it literally means actually I'm not sure what it literally means, but we use it we translate it often as beautiful. But what it really means? Good, I guess. In in the Singhala Wada Sutta also Kalyana with the like good friends, bad friends. So yeah, I'm just wondering what the word literally means. Mm. It's a very old word. It's not, uh, I don't have any derivation here. There's no root involved. That's funny. It's just an ancient word, I guess, from the Vedic. It's actually Vedic, Kalyana. It's literally from the Vedic, which is a very old language. Paragraph 135. The elder Sangara Kita, the great Mahasangara Kita, aged over 60, was lying, it seems, on his deathbed. The order of bhikkhus questioned him about attainment of the supramundane state. The elder said, I have no supramundane state. Then the young bhikkhu, who was attending on him, said, Venerable sir, people have come as much as 12 leagues, thinking that you have reached Nibbana. It will be a disappointment for many if you die as an ordinary man. Friend, thinking to see the blessed one Metea, I did not try for insight, so help me to sit up and give me the chance. He helped the elder to sit up and went out. As he went out, the elder reached Arahanship, and he gave a sign by snapping his fingers. The order assembled and said to him, Venerable sir, you have done a difficult thing in achieving the supramundane state in the hour of death. That was not difficult, friends. But rather, I will tell you what is difficult. Friends, I see no action done by me without mindfulness and unknowingly since the time I went forth. His nephew also reached our hardship in the same way at the age of 50 years. So it's uh, notable, first of all, that here is someone, an example of someone who appears to be fully enlightened, but turns out is just well, he's unenlightened, not ordinary, because he's actually quite remarkable, but it's a reminder that even back then there were people who uh, everyone thought was an arahant, but it turned out was not. Be careful before you're sure that someone else is this or that or the other thing. And the other thing is uh, how easy it is for such a determination as he has made to to bl completely block you from enlightenment. It's something we have to watch for people who have come from the Mahayana where they've made vows to become, to, vows to not attain enlightenment until all other beings are able to attain enlightenment as well. It also blocks them in a similar way. And it it's also just a bit weird because he's right next to a, a like the Buddha, no? He was alive uh, during. I don't think so, actually. Oh, okay. I think this is later. Yeah, it doesn't make sense to me if the Buddha is there already. Why would you want to wait for Mitteya? Is it the Blessed One, Mitteya, the future Buddha? Yes. He will come at um, a time, apparently, when beings have 20,000 year lifespan. So, not anytime soon. Okay. Um, then how come he was mindful? He was expecting to see the future Buddha, but he was mindful all the time? Oh, mindfulness is 
the right way to be? I don't understand because what I understand about mindfulness is like to understand the reality, what is going on in the present. But if someone is contemplating on seeing something in the future, how come this is mindfulness? It's a good point, but it's not an action. I think he's probably talking about physical actions, like he never walked or stood or sat or lay down, never did anything eating or bathing or anything unmindfully. So maybe this is the difference bef between formal practice and uh, just uh, being mindful during the day, right? No, I mean, if you have a wish to become a Buddha or see the Buddha, another Buddha in the future, it can stop you from attaining enlightenment. Even, I think, uh, becoming Sotapanna. Of course. But it's an interesting criticism to say that Hey, how can he? How can he? How can he claim to have been mindful all the time, which he's almost doing, and yet he's thinking about the future, wishing for something in the future. I mean, maybe he had a strong desire to uh, see the uh, future Buddha, but he wasn't uh, like thinking of that all the time. Yeah, maybe. I I just want to say that uh, sati is actually a universal, uh, beautiful chitta sika. So, I mean, in that sense, it's true. All right, 136. Now, if a man has little learning and he is careless of his virtue, they censor him on both accounts for lack of virtue and of learning. But if he is of little learning, yet he is careful of his virtue, they praise him for his virtue. So it, it is as though he too had learning, as if he is of ample learning, yet he is careless of his virtue, they blame him for his virtue, so it is as though he had no learning. But if he is of ample learning and he is careful of his virtue, they give him praise on both accounts, for virtue and as well for learning. The Buddha's pupil of much learning who keeps the law with understanding, a jewel of Jambu River gold, who is here fit to censor him. Deities praise him constantly, by Brahma also is he praised. One correction, edit the uh, sati is not sapachitta sadharana, it's ekagata. I think she said it's in all wholesome chittas. I did. Beautiful. Sapachitta sadharana means it's in all chittas, not just the wholesome ones. It's a different ah, yeah. Okay. All right. I didn't hear the wholesome part. Sorry. I said beautiful, but. You guys and your nitpicking Abhidhamma. <laughs> Thank you. Thank Appreciate. We have we now have Abhidhamma scholars here, so they can set us straight. Anybody know the story of the Jambu River? Paragraph hundred and thirty-seven. D. What should be understood as virtue consisting in purification, not adhered to in trainers, virtue. Because it is not adhered to by wrong view, an ordinary man's virtue when not adhered to by greed. Like the virtue of the elder Tisa, the, the landowner's son, Kutubiyaputta Tisa Terra, wanting to become established in Arahanship in dependence on such virtue, this venerable one told his enemies. I broke the bones of both my legs to give the pledge you asked from me. I am revolted and ashamed, a death accompanied by greed. And after I had thought on this, and wisely then applied insight, when the sun rose and shone on me, I had begun an arhant. So this is from the... I believe these Satipatthana Sutta commentary. I don't know if anyone recognizes this story, but Ajahn Tong used to tell this story. Well, I'll even put this part in. Why why it brings this story up is because it relates to one of the reasons why we practice mindfulness, and that's dukkha domanasa nang atangamaya. So if you haven't, if anyone hasn't read the way of mindfulness, it's a good thing to read if you have a chance. Uh, can I read it, Bante? 
what you just posted in the chat. Go ahead. Dukkha Domana Sang Athaya Gammaya. For the destruction of suffering and grief. For the cessation of bodily suffering and mental grief. This way maintained by contemplation is conducive to the destruction of suffering similar to that of the elder Tissa and of grief similar to that of Sakka. Tissa, the head of a family at Savati, renouncing 40 crores of gold, became a homeless one and dwelt in a forest far from other human beings. His sister-in-law sent a rubber band of 500 to score the forest in order to find him and ordered them to kill him when he was found. She sent him, it is said, in five batches of a hundred each in succession. After entering the forest and searching for the elder, they in due course came to the place in which he lived and sat round him. When the robbers surrounded him, the elder spoke thus, Lay disciples, why have you come? They replied, to kill you. Then the elder said, on a security, give me my life for just this one night. Said the robbers, oh recluse, who will stand surety for you in a place like this? The elder thereupon took a big stone, broke the bones of his legs, and said, Lay disciples, is the security of value? They, leaving the elder, went to the end of the ambulatory and, lighting a fire, lay on the ground. The elder, contemplating on the purity of his conduct, after suppressing his pain, attained our hardship. At dawn, Having fulfilled the recluse's regimen in the three watches of the night, giving expression to his feelings, he said, A shorty, let me raise breaking both my legs. To die with lustful mind, I loathe and shrink. Having thought thus, I saw things as they are, and with the dawn, I reached the Arhant's domain. This is a different translation. To the same uh, verse, right? Yes. I'm trying to think if there's another version of this story because I think I've heard a story that was a little more detailed, but maybe it was just extrapolating. But the, why is he saying his mind was filled with greed, basically? What kind of greed? So th he didn't want to die, or what way was his mind impure, basically? Where do you see that? In the second line in the verse, in both in both time translation. Uh -huh. well, he doesn't say he has it. He's just working to free himself from, from greed. Because he knows to die. He doesn't want to die with any greed in his mind. So he practices diligently. Thank you, Bhante. Raga is the word he used. Raga can also just mean passion. Mm -hmm. 138. Also, there was a certain senior elder who was very ill and unable to eat with his own hand. He was uh, rightly smeared with his own urine and excrement. Seeing him, a certain Yen Beiku said, Oh, what a painful process life is. The senior elder told him, If I were to die now, friend, I should obtain the bliss of heaven. I have no doubt of that. But the bliss obtained by breaking this virtue would be like the lay state obtained by disavowing the training. And he added, I shall die together with my virtue. As he lay there, he comprehended that same illness with insight, and he reached a handship. Having done so, he pronounced these verses to the order of Bekus. I am victim of a sickening disease that wrecks me with its burden of cruel pain. As flowers in the desert burned by the sand, so this my corpse where sun have withered. And beautiful called beautiful, 
and clean white wagon as if clean. Though full of ordure seem, seeming fair to him that cannot see it clear. So out upon this lying rotting body, fetid and filthy, punished with affliction, dotting on which this silly generation has lost the way to be reborn in heaven. What was the virtue he was trying to maintain? It sounds like almost like he means by killing himself, committing suicide, but I don't think. Maybe it's something to do with eating. He's unable to he eat said... with his own hand, so what? Yeah. I don't know how he, he would have broken the virtue. Isn't it related to the sickness? Because he says, comprehended that same illness with insight. Yeah, but what does that have to do with virtue? What virtue could he break to have bliss? What is he talking about? Bliss obtained by breaking this virtue. Sounds like he means if he dies and go to he goes to heaven, but I don't get it. My understanding of this part, um, along with 137, logically it seems like uh, 137 is talking about not adhere to two, not to, you know, attach you to. Then 138 says, um, the virtue could be something um, people or even monks or the uh, mindful practitioners could um, adhere to. So knowing that he will die together with the virtue that he probably he reached our handship. Is it is it not allowed for someone to feed him with their own hands? By any chance? Yeah, by sure it is. It sure is. Are you talking about uh, not committing suicide? That's what I thought at first. That's what it almost sounds like, right? This makes sense. Yeah, understandable. And also, in the second paragraph, he said, I'm beautiful, called beautiful. It's very deep <laughs> in terms of understanding here. Sounds like he's enlightened. And I he's... think, I think, actually, it's not that... I'm looking at the commentary, and based on what I can't quite translate the commentary, but I'm getting I got I get a sense of what it's talking about. It would take some time and more energy, but it has to do with his statement. He would he would obtain the bliss of heaven, which means he still has greed for the heavenly realms. He still has a desire for that, and. That would be unvirtuous. I think I'm stretching it, but I, I think it's something to do with the fact that heaven would be a breach of virtue. Either either uh, keeping the precepts in order to go to heaven, or, yeah, I think that's actually what it's related to, keeping the precepts in order to go to heaven. And he doesn't want that, so he he is going to keep his mind free from such intentions, keep his virtue um, not for the purpose of going to go to heaven. Bhava meva nadiyisami. I will not grasp bhava. That's what the commentary says. It's trying to explain this passage. I will not grasp becoming. Sati hi bhava dani. Grasping a bhava is the separation from sila. Hmm. I, don't, I can't quite translate it. So the part where he says, if he dies and goes to heaven, and in the end it says, by disavowing diso, diso, the training, this would be like disavowing the training. Mm -hmm. It makes sense. Yeah, it makes sense. Mm. Because the training isn't about you going to heaven, but to get mm -hmm. enlightened in the and if you didn't go to heaven, it would be like disrobing, because you yeah. can't be a monk in heaven. That makes sense. 
So I think that's the sort of thing he's trying to get at. But I still don't quite understand how this relates to sila, because it's more of a mental thing than it is. It's not like he's doing something, but I guess it's the keeping of the precepts for the purpose of going to heaven. But the, the commentary says um, clinging or grasping after bhava, after becoming, is a separation, is as if being separated from sila. No, but I guess that's it. It's um, He doesn't want to die with, with still desire for heaven because going to heaven would be a breach of sila, would be having to be be separated from sila. Now, I may be saying, repeating something someone already said, but I, I just get it now, I think. I think that's what it's about. It seems like in that very hard, you know, situation, he um, comprehended the the illness with insight so that's probably made the difference or helped him reach uh reach arahanship yeah well the illness certainly can help mm. but i think this relates to the, the what this is about as you said not adhered to relates to not adhered ordinary men's virtue when not adhered to by greed Mm. So if 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 his virtue is adhered to by greed, well, I guess it's an example of how he he realizes that he still has greed, and he wants to purify his mind so that he's not just keeping the precepts to go to heaven. He's not just being ethical and moral in order to go to heaven. Sanda, you had a question. Yeah, it says in the last um, verse. Uh, that has lost the way to be, uh, be reborn in heaven, but the verse before it, before it, dotting on which this silly generation, I, I do not quite understand. Yeah, it is funny that he then talks about the way to be reborn in heaven because he's also he's also lost the way. But here he's talking about how ordinary people don't know the way to heaven. He's not talking about how he has lost the way to be reborn in heaven. He's talking about how people, evil deeds, and so they can never go to heaven. Thank you, Bob. Yata pamatta adimuchita paja adimuchi. Muchita, this silly, <laughs> silly is not the best translation, I suppose. It's a big, much bigger word than silly. Adimuchita means excessively infatuated with successively infatuated generation. Bandi, I do have a question. Looking back on 135 and uh, up to 138, um, they give two, um, two cases in a very extreme situations, like the final stage in an hour of, of death and also uh, in a very um, unhealthy situations in enduring illness. So how could we put those extreme cases together to understand that practice or keeping the mindfulness or virtual is uh, very necessary? I think what these teach us is more important than the precepts, in fact, is your... your quality of mind and why you keep the precepts and uh, how dedicated you are to the path so it's showing dedication and it's showing their philosophical reflection that it isn't quite meditation but it's it's this vimangsa where they step back and consider and adjust their practice saying mm, like the first guy, he, he realizes that he has to go further than he thought he might, and he has to give up even his own legs. He has to realize how he's even attached to his body and go beyond that attachment. In the second one, he he has to give up heaven. He realizes that he's still... It, it probably scares him to think or excites and like, invigorates him to realize that He's uh, in trouble now that he might go to heaven, which is a scary, horrible, awful thought. Oh no, I might go to heaven. Why? And as he says, because he's uh, he's still... Well, if he goes to heaven, he loses his state of being a monk. 
and the other one was attached to meeting the next Buddha. But it's interesting that all three are uh, in time of death, in their death. Hmm. Well, death is another one of the... I don't know where Ajahn Tong took this from, but I'm, it's got to be somewhere that I haven't found yet. Where Actually, in fact, I, I scoured the text trying to find it, but he called them Samasisi, which... He didn't always get his poly right, so it was often hard to figure out what the actual poly was. But it's um, four ways that people become enlightened. One is with the ending of illness. With the ending of illness, uh, there is the ending of defilements. And one is with the ending of pain. There is an ending of, suffer of defilements. One is with the ending of life, there is the ending of defilements, and the other one is with the change of postures, the ending of a posture. So when you switch postures, there's the ending of defilements. And I think you would tell this story with, I can't remember what the one was for sickness though, but for pain, he would tell the story of the monk who broke his legs. I feel like we, we are getting the best stories here in the Visuddhimagga. It has so many stories. But all compiled into this. <laughs> Very useful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's true. I mean, they're all throughout the commentaries, to be honest. And you see he's referring to them in the commentaries. It's just that this is the only commentarial text, well, one of the few that is actually translated. So a lot of them he's pulling from other places. And this one is uh, actually from the Jataka, so you could read it in the Jatakas as well. We reached the hour, so if anyone has questions about previous paragraphs as well, and just go ahead and ask them. Um, do you mind if I ask another kind of question? Um, I'm, I'm looking at 130, 131, and uh, it mentioned centers are destroyed. This is um, in 130. In 131, very uh, end of that paragraph also mentioned centers destroyed. This phrase was also mentioned in last week's uh, 126. Seven. So, what is this uh, phrase referring to? How do we know that cankers are destroyed? Well, it's the asava, so it's any kind of attachment to the world. Okay. Uh, attachment to samsara. I just wanted to uh, to mention about the. Um... Uh, a few moments ago when Abante mentioned that the monk, he was kind of terrified of, of rebirth in heaven and uh, how it struck him as so, sort of, you know, a frightening or terrifying thought. And, it, you know, I think to, to a lot of us, you know, it, it might not be something we'd, we'd grasp uh, right away, like, oh, why would heaven be a little bit frightening? But you think about just, you know, how long the lifespan is there and, uh, you know, it's just just one one lifetime, and you know, so many people could be reborn in heaven. Think, oh, this is forever. All my problems are solved, and then ne next lifetime after that could be anything. You know, it it re really is when you give it a little bit of thought, a, a little bit terrifying to think about. You know, just any form of rebirth, good or bad, because it still keeps going. So I, I don't know that that just just really kind of kind of struck me when I when I heard that. Well, we shouldn't really be afraid of heaven. Heaven is, in fact, probably the best bet if you're going to be reborn anywhere. So for most people, Buddhist meditators included, it's a good idea to orientate yourself around heaven because that's where a lot of Buddhists have gone. So if you're reborn in heaven, you have a good chance to. Keep up with the Buddha's teaching.
That's good to keep in mind. Thank you, Bonte. You know, the, the, the deep and dedicated practitioner goes beyond that and says, as you say, rebirth itself is is a step down. Yes. Especially yes, for it, someone who's ordained as a monk and has the monk's life. If you're not a monk, then maybe not so much a step down, maybe a step up. Oh, if I'm born in heaven, I won't have to work and I won't have to have a family and be able to dedicate myself truly to the practice. Whereas a monk thinks, oh, if I be going to heaven, I won't have the same opportunity as, as a monk. It's good to con consider both, though, because I don't think I, you know, give the quite, quite enough consideration to... If you're reborn, you know, a good rebirth is is a good thing, you know, if you're not, not to the point of no more rebirths. One step at a, at a time. Don't worry yourself too much. Um, Bhante, I remember I asked about uh, practicing on-site, meaning going to the temple or in, in Thailand um, in summertime or... When will be a proper time to go there on site if somebody wants to plan the trip? So I missed that you want to come to Thailand? Um, I'm thinking about uh, to practice mindfulness or, or meditation in, in Thailand sometime. Uh, maybe in the summer or the winter break, but I don't know if there will be a session or not, or, or which, when, when will be the better time? As soon as possible. As soon as possible. So um, how about this summer? Yeah. Do we have any? Okay. Um, pretty soon. <laughs> okay. Um, I probably could check the website, right, to get more information. Shub's question is: There is a person suffering from oral cancer. My pet dog is also suffering from skin cancer. Both. We don't really teach you how to help other people. Teach you how to help yourself. That can help other people. If you help yourself, you help others as well. But it's not really what we teach. The Buddha taught that you the best is to focus on yourself anyway. I mean it kind of doesn't mean that you don't help other people, but when you teach people how to help themselves, then they're better at helping other people. We don't ever really have to teach people how to help others. It's not what we teach. You want to help them, help yourself. Then you'll know the answer on how to help them. One one thing, uh, I mean, I'm not su surprised, but one thing stuck out for me from all these stories that uh, basically how into that to become our hand and uh, not like compassion or meta or anything like that. So whenever somebody would ask that question, like, is it important to do this other practices? No, it's not. I mean, compassion comes naturally to a person who is mindful. But still, like wisdom is the most important for for understanding your situation, the greed, the attachment to Bala, to you know everything, the sickness. Yeah, of course. Everything. I mean, uh, if the depending on the situation, both wisdom and compassion can arise. But wisdom is very necessary, and compassion is not that necessary. That's what I'm saying. Could argue that compassion is part of the noble eightfold path, but it is not like if, if one is arguing that uh, practicing compassion is the way to enlightenment, then that is wrong. 
Abi apa the sangka pes? Basically, no sorry, apa insa sangka pes? Basically, compassion. And about the course, <clears throat> so these are the starting dates as we we talked about previously, and they say that the duration of stays, uh, what they recommend between seven and twenty six days, and. Uh, uh when we go there would we uh practice with you Banta? If I'm here you would yeah. You mean by instructor to do something but uh, something not suitable well, for monks? No 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 the way I teach is very specific. But the way they teach here is also very specific and it's complicated because the narrative is such that this is the original way that it was taught in this tradition, but that's that's a simplistic narrative. The truth is that there were I mean, actually I, I I'm just going by what I understand. As far as I understand, the truth is that even here there were two ways of teaching. And for some reason the monk who taught the foreign students here taught differently from Ajahn Tong in some small ways. One not so small way. And the narrative has become that that's, that monk's way is the way. And so when I, who have learned directly from Ajahn Tong, and in a way that I'm pretty sure he he didn't suddenly change or or over time change when he moved to Jom Tong, and it wouldn't matter if he did because still it's how he taught before he passed away. Then to come back here is uh, there's a disconnect, and so it's not even just that I teach differently; it's that I'm not teaching the original way somehow. So I can't even say to them that the way I'm teaching is authentic and the way Ajahn Tong teaches, especially since Ajahn Tong's no longer around. So I'm in an yeah. awkward position of, on the one hand, trying to teach here, and on the other hand, completely dedicated to teaching the way I learned from Ajahn Tong. I, I'm reluctant to change anything about that. I mean, I've spent the past 20 years trying to be to teach as close to, to him as I possibly could often, or sometimes anyway, even in ways that I wasn't clear why, but out of deference to him and respect to him. So to suddenly be told I have to change is not pleasant. But even that is, you know, I can change in small ways, but when it comes to certain ways of teaching, I, I'm not comfortable crossing certain lines. Like there's, a, there's something that he told me specifically not to teach a certain way, and now I'm already being asked to teach that way and so I'm just disobeying it until they make clear that it's not going to be tolerated. They want you to teach Anapanasati instead of Asisayatati? No, 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 it's not that extreme. <laughs> that would be, I would, I would have left already if that were the case. No, they want me to tell the meditators how many hours per day they have to practice. That's what it comes down to. That's the line I'm not yet willing to cross. And there's, I mean, I, on on the one hand, I don't agree with it, but more importantly, Ajahn Tong specifically told me not to. I mean, you could argue that that was a one-time thing and it was not when I was living here. And... Probably Ajahn Tong would say it's okay if for me to do that while I'm living here because, well, if I want to stay here, I have to get along. I don't think Ajahn Tong would likely tell me to stay here, especially considering that I teach differently. So it's a, it's a dilemma. They push the meditators to do more than they're sometimes comfortable doing. And so they'll do it, but they're stressed about it and they're fixated on the hours. And I've seen it now firsthand because I'm trying to sort of meet them halfway by encouraging them to do more. And even just me encouraging them to do more practice, which is something Ajahn Tong never did. Even that is 
sometimes fixating people more on the hours than on the moments. So I'm often pretty clear to tell them that the hours aren't the most important thing. There's here the hours are kind of presented to the meditators as very important. You can move to Sri Lanka, but if Yes. We're talking sure, about yeah. it. So none of none of you, sorry, none of you have heard any of these conversations, but we've had lots of conversations about these things in, in the board of directors channel. So Sri Lanka is on our list. I've been pushing, not pushing for it per se, but oh yeah, you know this because Austin got in touch with you, right? Um, that we're, we're, we're discussing Sri Lanka. Can I can uh, introduce you to a monk I know very well. You would yeah. be in a better position to help you with it. No, Sri Lanka is high on my list for sure. Who gave the name to Chris? I'm curious. Someone in the office, you know. I was hoping that you gave him the name, but no. No, I have no say in any. It's because of the day he was born. He was born on a Friday, so he got a sub name. I would be surprised if it if it wasn't just a good reason it's a good name so the moon yeah. has a lot of has a lot of symbolism in buddhism yeah it is auntie just being um specific about your teaching schedule um thanks to richardo he shared the schedule i saw um possible times one is in probably july the other one is in december you mentioned it could be as soon as possible so do you know if uh, in july or december you will be still teaching or so i could come over or right now it's uncertain i don't even know if i'll be alive in july and i'll be dead by then you might be dead by then but um, that whole talk about this place was actually more to say that I meant to continue by saying that, or conclude by saying that probably it's still okay because if I don't stay here, it's quite likely that I'll just go to Jomtong, which is a very similar situation to here. So even if you did uh, book a course for here and it turned out that in the meantime, I wasn't here, that I would probably just be in Chantan. Okay, thank you. We will keep you updated anyway. Okay, thanks. Is it or... problem with going to Sri Lanka is it doesn't, I mean, we'd have to start something new there and we wouldn't have the rooms that we have here or the setup the way we have here, so it would be starting fresh. So that's more of a a little bit more long-term plan. I mean, it makes sense that that would be a little more long-term. You could do a short visit, Bhante, and see, uh, identify a place and get all the information required. It's a good, good idea. So once I move to Jom Tong, I might be able to do that. I can just take time off because there's other teachers and I could just pass my students off to other teachers. It wouldn't be ideal, but could also just book time off in advance and just tell people not to come during those times. Here I can't go anywhere, right? At the moment I can't do it, but I can't even leave because I'm teaching 30 new students came today. Yeah, and your Vasa is coming up as well, so you won't be able to travel. Well, that's a good point. So yeah, if, if the Wasa starts and I'm in some place, chances are I'll be there for the next three months. When does Wasa start? July, I think. Can I ask uh, about Chris? If you were to leave Banta, he will stay there, or? Uh, I think he would go with me, but you'd have to ask him. I mean, basically, um, Siri Mongols. We would we would definitely support both uh, Bante and Chris in the future. I mean, 
everyone here in the community who will be supporting two monks from now on. You already ordained? Or? Uh, two days from now, Tuesday. Ah, okay. Will it be called uh, Mogaraja Bhant? Something new? No. Go to the announcement. He will, he will be Siri Chando. Yeah, that's another thing about ordaining here is I can't get to choose the names. We, if we ordain people in Sri Lanka, I could be the preceptor and ordain them myself. Give them better names. This is also a good exercise, Bhante, to be like you're not in control and everything, and you have to give control of it. Oh, yeah, I'm not complaining about that. It's just a shame that I can't give better names. Well, you can still give one name. No? No, no, no it's on his certificate. He wouldn't want to change his name. Well, I think it can be done, actually. I was told that I should change my name. A monk, this this what this foreign monk, was into a lot of ridiculous uh, superstition, and he said my name was not very powerful. I should ask for a new name, and it was more powerful. Uh, do you have a name uh, in mind for Chris? No. Well, I was going to name him Kasapa because it sounds like Christopher. Wow, that's very, very honorable. My goodness. But, but can I ask, are, are you not the preceptor for Chris? You are not Chris's preceptor? No. No, I'm not allowed to ordain people in Thailand. Most monks aren't. You get the permission for that? Yeah, and most monks can't even get permission. You have they have to, you have to take um course and exams or something, but they only give it to to very important monks, I think. My father's name is Chandra, so similar meaning. Old. What does Siri mean, Sanka? Siri I think the same as Sri, like Sri Lanka. Yeah, yeah what does it mean? Something like oh, you say to give honor to a person, that me to come the set meeting. I like uh, what do we say? Uh, glorious. I like glorious. I found that somewhere. It has connotations like holy, but those may have been sort of later connotations. Your name Revered was given. Bante, your name was given by uh, Venerable. Mangala, right? Gentle. Yeah, technically, but not practically. Practically, some monk in an office came up with it from oh. a book. Actually, I'm not sure. Ajantong may have chosen them, but I don't think so, because there were 18 of us, and it was all sort of uh, temporary ordinations. The other, at least six, uh, 15 of the others were just ordained for a week or two. So uh, the word Siri has the meaning noble, royal, sacred, success, wealth, fortune, beauty, prosperous, sacred, yeah, highest. Sacred. I like glorious. Glorious felt the best so far. So oh, beauty. Yeah, beauty is an interesting one. That's That's actually what the Thai translation says. Something that is beautiful like the moon. But the moon isn't really beautiful. And Siri doesn't mean beauty. Siri means uh, resplendent, maybe. No, but it's more like glorious. Majestic is another word, but majestic has royal connotation. It's also, uh, it's also used with the word uh, Vimala. Vimala Siri. Nameless, pure. And beautiful. That's actually a name in Sri Lanka. My dad's middle name is Vimana Siri. Um, are you the teacher for Chris then? Yeah. Meditation teacher, right? So the 
Vinaya, he will learn from somebody else. No, he'll learn that from me as well. Oh, that's good. All right. Have a good week, everyone. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Bante.